retire and somebody hands us a pre-programmed script to read from. You know, there are just so many things not in our control. Uh, Don's wise words, especially about discernment of gifts, touched me deeply. So uh, with that, I would like to invite Don to read Timing Beyond Our Control. Thank you, Jerry. Timing Beyond Our Control. It's all timing, timing over which you have no control. My best friend, partner, and spouse of 32 years has long said this. Herself a retired officer, she experienced that as a truism many times. The corollary truth is that sometimes the timing goes your way and sometimes it doesn't. And usually we can't tell which category it falls into until years later. Every veteran would recognize and agree with the mystery of timing. Each veteran has their own version of how timing affected their journey serving in uniform. For my father, it was volunteering to enlist during the Korean War. He was aware it was the only time in its history the Marine Corps actually had to resort to drafting men to make their quota, rather than just making numbers by those who wanted to join. My dad knew his chances to survive the war were improved by going into the Army. The no control cooked in when surprisingly, he not only didn't go to Korea, but aside from schooling, spent all his duty time in Stuttgart, Germany. For an American Legion friend of mine, the haunting no control moment was at graduation from basic training when his drill sergeant went down the line identifying every other soldier for duty in Vietnam. For him, the seemingly random selection of a man on both his right and left for immediate departure to that war zone remains a traumatic memory. He lives with unanswered questions about whether either, either of those men their names unknown to him, survived. As timing would have it for me, I entered college just as the Women's Army Corps was disbanding and the transition of women into the all-volunteer force had begun. Cadre recruiting for ROTC programs across the nation were meeting their enrollment numbers by turning to female students. Those recruiters then, as now, found collegiate women athletes, such as myself, had attributes that fit well with military service. My first assignment was ideal for a farm girl from South Dakota. While Fort Polk, Louisiana had a reputation for being one of the least desirable postings in the Army, including being far removed from the closest urban area, being 60 miles from the nearest stoplight was nothing new for me. During those three years, I had the great good fortune of being mentored by two exceptional senior raiders. Both were combat wounded veterans of Vietnam. They approached their officers, non-commissioned officers and soldiers with full faith and confidence. We were up to the task of our missions until you proved otherwise. In the next 10 years, I experienced leadership that took exactly the opposite tact, assuming you were inadequate until you, until you proved otherwise. I found the first approach much more inspiring and productive. Timing found me in Central Europe for my second tour, arriving just six, arriving six weeks after the Chernobyl disaster. More specifically, I was assigned to Darmstadt, south of Frankfurt, in what was then the Federal Republic of Germany. There were over 300,000 members of US Armed Forces assigned within the American zone of occupation at that time. You couldn't throw a rock without hitting a US concern, installation, airfield, or housing area. Travel in our host country was always enjoyable and made even more so by the fact a little America was never far away. Looking back, it's apparent my tour coincided with the three-year height of the Cold War. November 9th, 1989 marked the fall of the Berlin Wall. That day was also my 31st birthday. 
Seven days prior, I had taken command of a military police company near Stuttgart, only miles from where my father had been stationed. On that milestone day, I had called in a zero dark 30 unannounced emergency deployment readiness exercise in order to do my commander's assessment of the unit. I did not yet know a spokesman for the Communist Party had only hours before announced a suspension of the travel restrictions between East Berlin and free West Berlin. As I was observing my soldiers performing the well-trained and habitual tasks of preparing to depart the installation for movement to our general defense position, we were simultaneously monitoring the unfolding events taking place 400 miles away in Berlin. That day itself was awash in high and varied emotions. Initially, it was disorienting. Could this actually be happening? Was this a ruse or a feint? What kind of sub subterfuge might be at work? The suspicion was a natural and logical response. Thankfully, none of our worst fears materialized. Seeing exuberant Germans was itself unnerving. The absence of the usual stoicism, that is the predominantly fixed emotional state of the German people, was proof itself that a historic moment was upon us. The sheer joy of seeing the reunion taking place between a people previously long separated was contagious. Even though my military career spanned 26 years, including six years after 9-11, I've always considered myself primarily a warrior of the Cold War. That identity was cemented because my boots were on the ground in the years leading up to that eventful day on which the Berlin Wall fell. It would be a year later, October 3rd, 1990, when the reunification of Germany became official, meaning that for literally millions of US forces serving throughout the previous 45 years, a strategic mission was accomplished. The mystery of timing. I didn't perceive it in those heady days, but when the Cold War moved into the win category, the push to reap the peace dividend began immediately. Less than four years after that memorable day for democracy, a third of all US military had received their pink slips, and I was one of them. That timing was nothing short of difficult. Yet the gift, only discernible with the passage of time was the better than even trade to begin a life together with my beloved. I was also able to follow a long held calling to attend seminary. Like many service members who not of their own choosing left active duty in the years after the fall of, of the Berlin Wall, I was relegated to simply being a name in a computer database. But the wheel always turns and only two years later, I got the call saying I was needed back on active duty. Seems the drawdown had been a bit too effective and it really hadn't been the end of history after all. I also got the call at home after 9-11. On the Sunday after that awful Tuesday, I was walking through a virtually empty airport terminal that felt altogether like a morgue. The next two years was mostly sitting at a computer pushing emails around. At least the monthly airborne jumps reminded me I was still a soldier supporting the mission from afar. The only thing I ever really influenced in my career was the date and place of my retirement. I decided that having put my grain of sand on the beachhead of freedom and before I became part of the problem rather than part of the solution, I would choose the details of my own exit strategy. That event really was a time of my life moment. It's all timing, timing over which you have no control. Sometimes the timing, sometimes the timing goes your way and sometimes it doesn't. Usually we can't tell which category it falls into until years later. All the duty stations, all the missions, all the comrades in arms met along the way. The timing wasn't my own, but I wouldn't have had it 
any other way. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Yeah. So um, moving on to uh, another of the finalists, um, the experience of Vietnam veterans, and I've had the privilege of working with a, a number over the last eight years or so, are often some of the hardest to bear witness to. Um, I have sat in a room where more than once I've heard a Vietnam veteran say, I've never told this story to anybody before I came to a writing workshop. And every time I hear that, I, I end up pulling out my own box of Kleenex, honestly. Um, each one of those stories is like a gift to those of us who served after that war. And every Vietnam veteran story reveals new details, new insights, new understanding into a war that had started uh, just just really a few months before I was born, but was kind of the uh, the background of my my childhood and my my youth. Uh, you know, I grew up watching the war on uh, the six o'clock evening news and following relatives who were um, serving in country. So, uh, Tony Tony Garcia's uh, essay short was very much like that. It was a gift that brought me into a new place, a new understanding of service during that era, and it was a place where identity and heritage and military service intersected in a way that I found really interesting. Uh, I also laughed. I, I really want to know, Dr. Garcia, are you still making the rounds with the girls? <laughs> so, um, um, also, uh, the, the essay made my heart beat faster when I read that Dr. Garcia had been a door gunner. Uh, some, some of the uh, that's I've worked with have been door gunners, and uh, it's there's a lot more to it, I think, than what you see in the little film clips on TV. Um, so, with that, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Garcia to read his essay short. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'll say <clears throat> before I read my story, I want to say uh, thank you to uh, Jerry uh, for and then the uh, uh, South Dakota Humanities. Um, and all the sponsors and then for the selection. Um, really didn't think too much about it, but my daughter, she uh, in, encourages me. She tells me to write. Um, I don't know how well my internet works. We I live in a rural area, so the connection is uh, often poor. Um, I wanted her to read, but she didn't make it back in time. So I'm gonna do the best I can here. I'm a little nervous. My story starts with my enlistment in the Army. I was 19 years old, an American Indian with a Mexican last name, male, poor, divorced parents, and a dropout. I was living in St. Paul, Minnesota with my mom, my, step, my stepfather, who was white, and younger brothers and sisters. My mom was a full-blood young to a Yankton Sioux, born and raised on the Yankton Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. I was raised by my mom's people, and like many Indian children, my grandmother was important in my life. She passed away when I was 12. I was fortunate to have family members who were good role models. They taught me my values and beliefs. One was males were the primary providers and protectors of the family. I didn't want to be a burden to my mom and could, could and did not want to stay home. I had to and wanted to do something, but didn't know what the outlook was not good. One day in early fall, I went to the Army recruiting office and enlisted. I was one of the few who actually enlisted for Vietnam. I had a desire to serve and be a warrior since childhood, so it was natural for me. I also had one of those I don't care attitudes. So I signed up for an all expense paid vacation to the warm lands of Southeast Asia. I remember when I was a junior in high in uh, junior high, about 12 years old, a male teacher told the class, and he singled us boys out, that we would probably be going to Vietnam. At the time, I thought the war would be over before then. Well, that day came, and I remember what he said. After I signed all the papers and passed all the physical exams and tests, I was sworn in. 
The recruiter asked if I wanted a delayed entry and report around Christmas. I thought that was all right and said okay, and I spent the next three, four months saying goodbye, especially to the girls. After a while, they started asking if I was actually leaving. I guess I made too many rounds with my story. On December 23rd, 1970, about 4 a.m., I was to report to downtown St. Paul to catch a bus. I remembered a time my mom knew I was leaving, which wasn't new to her. I often left and stayed with other relatives. It was early when I got up and woke up my mom and stepdad. They would give me a ride downtown. I remember it was really cold that morning and dark. No one really said anything, and I don't remember saying anything. Once we got there, I got out of the car and said goodbye and got on the bus. Everything seemed to go fast after this. I reported to Fort Campbell, Kentucky for basic training for eight weeks and then went to uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama for AIT, which was for aircraft mechanics. I would end up as a door gunner in Nam. I remember standing information when we graduated from AIT and was given a certificate. The first thought that came to my mind was my schooling. I knew I could do things despite what my teacher said to me in school or how they treated me. I often felt like it was a failure, but my experience in the Army proved that I wasn't. A few days after I completed my AIT, a sergeant asked me why I was still in Fort Rucker. He said my orders were in and I was headed for Nam. I said I didn't know. He said he would get my orders if I gave him 10 bucks. I said, yeah, as soon as I could clear payroll, but I needed my orders first. He gave me my orders and I cleared payroll, but never gave him the money. I figured he was trying to rip me off, but I came from the residue hustle. My order said I had 10 days leave before leaving for Nam. I headed home and spent the next 10 days visiting and seeing the girls. I didn't have much money because when I got home, my mom <clears throat> was without electricity. They could not pay their bills, so I paid it, but it took all I had. I still had a good time. When the time came, I flew from St. Paul to California. I was given new gear fatigues and sent to Vietnam. The plane was a big one and had only soldier boys on it. There must have been a couple of hundred. We first flew to Alaska, then to Japan, from there went on to Vietnam. When we got close to Nam, everyone was pretty excited or nervous. As the pilot announced our descent into Cameron Bay, South Vietnam, everybody was quiet. I don't remember the hour, but it was dark. It was a dark night with no stars. All lights were turned off inside and outside the aircraft on the descent. Didn't want to make it easy for the enemy to shoot us, I guess. When we first entered the aircraft, I grabbed a window seat because I needed to see outside. I did not like the aisle or middle seat. As I looked out my window, I could see a helicopter strafing along the runway. It looked like fireworks, a real war zone, and it made me feel very anxious. Once we landed and stopped, my feelings of anxiousness increased an extreme high all at once. This feeling would become the norm in the days to come. I don't think I was scared at first. That would come later in an experience of the fear of death, which changed my attitude for life. But that is another story. When we came to stop, we were told to move to the doors to keep moving and not stop. Sergeants were shouting at us, keep moving, not stop, and get to the buses that were waiting. As I took my first step into the doorway, two things hit me like a wall. It caused me to pause at the door and look. The first was the heat and humidity. I never experienced anything like it in my life. It was like walking into an asana, really hot, even though it was night. The second and most unforgetful was the smell. It smelled like something was dead. In that moment, I learned what war smelled like. The smell would permeate our clothing and souls for the rest of our lives. When we experienced, saw, and felt the actual death of others, that would never leave us. When we got on the bus, which is like a school bus, we were told to take a seat and keep quiet. Once again, I grabbed the window seat 
which had metal screens. I was thinking I wanted a weapon and was kind of angry. They didn't give me one when I got off the plane. When we got to a hooch, it took a while for us to settle down. Guys were talking, but it wasn't loud. When we noticed a mosquito started in on us, which was bad, couldn't, keep, couldn't sleep the first night because of them. Curled up in my pouch or roasted, but the minute I came out for air, they would bite the hell out of you. Once in country, I stayed in Cameron Bay for a couple of days until I was assigned to a duty sta station. I had time to process when I entered end of the service to the time I entered Nam, starting with the cold night in December 1970, and four months later, April 1971, I was in Nam. I had a year to serve in country and was just starting my first and only overseas, overseas tour of duty. When I was given my duty assignment a place called Zeon, I was told to catch a ride on a deuce nav truck, which would take me there. In order to get there, we needed to leave the base and enter open country. That was something, because when we left the base and entered the territory, the roadside was covered with graves. I thought to myself, the people buried their dead where they could. The ride was long and hot. As I was getting into the truck, two guys were uh, waiting. The one guy riding shotgun quickly slid over, told me to ride shotgun, and shoved his M16 into my hands, which was great with me. I finally had a weapon in my hands. When he did this, he said, I'm too short. I figured he was talking about getting shot, and the door was not safe. And I would be his shield if we took fire. He's left in country before and she told me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, and um, the uh, the third piece that uh, I would like to introduce and then ask uh, uh, the author to read is a <coughs> cycle of poems. The trigger. Uh, the poem. I when I first opened it up, opened up the file and looked at it, I thought, oh no, poetry, because I'm so intimidated by poets and what they do. Uh, the first class that I had to take in grad school for creative writing was a um, comparative uh, contemporary American literature class, and they threw a book of Tony Hecht's poetry at us, and there were so many allusions in it that I had to read it with Google. And I would see something and I would go, oh, it must be an illusion. I'll look it up because if it didn't come out of the Bible or Greek mythology, I, I was clueless. You could tell what he was doing, but it was just all whoop, over my head. So I thought, oh, great, poems. And what happened when I started reading Jill Baker's poetry cycle is I felt like I got invited to go on a journey. And it was a journey that I think is familiar to a lot of veterans and honestly not just veterans i think it uh, transcends the veteran experience and that is the journey of healing from trauma and of taking a group of um, fragmented memories and emotions and images and giving them shape and giving them purpose and uh, creating a kind of narrative arc, even if the poems are lyric poems and not narrative poems. And uh, I, I did not want to put them down. I was uh, grateful to be invited into Jill's world through her poetry. And I could feel the process of healing as she, uh, as, as those poems went on. And by the end, when that final resonant line uh, came up, I just, I, I, I felt, found that I'd been sort of breathing in rhythm with the poems and I could sort of feel my shoulders dropping and the breaths got a little bit deeper. So I just want to uh, uh, thank Jill for inviting me to join her on that healing journey and ask her to read uh, from The Trigger. Thank you. I'll do my best. Um, Dawn and Tony, I just really appreciate, you know, you sharing your stories. They're really powerful and I really appreciate it. Um, so I will just start reading The Trigger. 
As a U.S. Army veteran living with post-traumatic stress disorder, I am not always able to tap into my feelings or cognitively understand what's happening around me. I liken this sense of displacement to a sort of temporary dyslexia. Things don't make sense when fight, flight, freeze settles into my bones. During these moments, I train myself to pick up the pen and unscramble the emotions that keep me locked up inside. The act of writing gives me clarity when my brain has short-circuited due to stressful triggers, which are physical, physiological, and emotional that accompany PTSD. The following poetic reflections were written during a recent difficult period in my life. They are tangled webs of messy emotions that I used to help me unravel the discord one step at a time. I am sharing them in chronological order as a way to demonstrate the process I took to help me work through months of harrowing days as a triggered veteran. This process often helps me make wiser decisions and the words that come out of me let me know when I need to pick up the phone and call for help. If you are struggling with PTSD, I pray that the short collection of poems about my personal journey through freeze moments will help you read you are not alone. September, trigger. It starts with ammunition in whatever shape or form it happens to come in. It hasn't penetrated my flesh, but the threat is there, sending cold shivers along my spine. My ears perk up, my senses sharpen, and I try to dodge the bullet that as of yet hasn't been fired. Sometimes I catch the danger signs early enough to heed their warning, save myself from the damage of their laser-focused intrusion. Other times, someone or something finds its way to the handle and pulls the trigger before I can safely get away. It is in those times when the bullet has rammed its way into my heart, past my defenses, that the pain and anguish come flooding in. My shadow is ripped from my body, sending me straight into a hell of my own making. It is in those times when I must rally within, though I feel helpless in my search to find such fortitude and prepare myself to face the ravaging cycle that plays out before I can feel whole again, feel safe and in control again. April, Night Invaders. Mostly, the monsters that invade my sleep are human. Sometimes I know them. Sometimes they are glimmers of people I feel I should know. Other times, it's as if they were familiar to me in a past life. These nightmares startle me awake in a drenching sweat, and I can't get back to sleep for what seems like half the night. My head remains full of terrifying pictures, so much so that I can't release myself from their trappings. Monsters linger in the dark corners of the room, causing me to pull my arms and feet in close like a child, lest they stray over the bed. While I don't analyze the majority of these nightmares, I find I must face the monsters I know in real life within a few days or a week to calm me. Otherwise, anxiety plays cruel tricks behind my back, and I'm not very fun to be around. August. Cat and Mouse. An early morning thunderstorm matches the roiling tension, but threatening to soak my confidence in a gush of tainted rain. Past wrongs come marching to the surface again, spark like a match lit by lightning. A boom of thunder akin to pain-filled memories, carefully and deliberately packed away, shakes my body like a rag doll. They haunt me as I sip hot coffee and pet my dog though she too is disturbed by the thunder. Confession, I have to go to work today, walk into a mousetrap laid by a clever cat. Such circumstances eerily familiar and a kind of wild desperation disturbs my peace. My legs feel leaden, blood running hot and cold. With a tightened jaw and quivering resolve, I will see this day through just as I have always done. Maybe justice will serve me this time, though I won't hold my breath. Broken dreams have only ever been the cause of speaking out. 
Wow, the rain is really coming down now. August, troubling days. Arise, O oh sun, shine your healing light upon the earth, the trees, the flowers, my porch. Creep upward your oranges, pinks, and reds to fill the limitless sky with hope for a new day. Bring with you renewal, mind, body, spirit, free and cleanse of the darkness, reluctant to give way to the light. Find me clear-minded, open-hearted, and strong of will. Prepare me for the troubling days to come. September, diamond in the rough. It's difficult to understand why doing your best in the workplace can lead to job insecurity. Striving to make a difference in the service of others, opening your heart and mind to those you spend your week with. On a good day, the, familiar, the fulfillment of a job well done sends me soaring like an eagle across the vast sky, allowing me to alight upon the wide boughs of a grand tree, my sharp talons holding firm. But on a bad day, one that usually involves the tainted lust of power, well, that can bring out the darkness and sun as they lash out with tongues like whips and wound the chains that bind, tethering me to a tiny space where no light can seep in. In those moments, I become stiff and frozen, a translucent icicle clinging to a roof line from the outside looking in. It certainly makes me ponder my own sanity for what is wrong with doing your best with what you have been given in order to lift up another. Is the need to maintain, maintain power so alluring that even a soul which brags of divinity would go beyond their own preachings to keep the light of another hidden away like a diamond in the rough? October, how will you use it? We all have something in our lives that elicits pain and sorrow, but something might give us pause for a day, a week, a month, a year. Then we settle successfully. Then we settle successfully incorporating the new into the old. Then there are those experiences that are life-changing, causing such a monumental shift in the gut, heart, and soul that we are forever different and that which we were is no more. Whether that change be for the better or the worse is not for us to choose as is something most likely is beyond our control or comprehension at the time of its making. But now that that something has happened, what will you do with it? If for the better, I pray that you allow it to expand past the confinement of your own self. If for the worse, I pray that you allow it to do good and expand it past the confinement of your own self. Otherwise, it might slowly chip away at your goodness until you are something that you hate. So I ask you, how will you use it? November, bending the past. The past is a tangled mess of bright and dull memories, all interwoven so tightly together that to mend a tear in its fabric can seem irreparable and dense. A hurt from today can be caused by a ratty thread torn loose in a second, or it can span across space and time to a tiny snip Liquored, layered, and hidden away within childhood memories. Seen in this regard, a skilled weaver are capable of such skill and empathy that we can thread the needle with the right color and length to effectively stitch the tear tightly enough that it will not rip again. Better to mend the past with a multitude of weavers, all skilled in their own ways, loving and respecting the different facets of your many selves rather than attempt such a feat alone. A hurt, a hurt need not be felt in solitude. Four hands are better than two and eight hands are better than four to patch and mend torn and tattered things. January, triumph from tragedy. <clears throat> Who knows your personal tragedies better than you? Though the ability to stamp out the fires of difficult times may be buried deep beneath the suffocation of burdens that seem overwhelming at the summit's base, I challenge you to rise like a phoenix and build your destiny from the ashes of the past. Strengthen your soul even as smoke fills your nostrils and burns your lungs. Allow tragedy to become your triumph 
as you sharpen your eyes and horizon in celebration of a life worth living. You are tragedy. You are triumph. You are the phoenix. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, I think uh, the moment that we've been waiting for, I have some awards to pass out. I got the certificates in the mail today. Everything is signed. And I'll have them back in the mail out to South Dakota on Monday morning. So um, from the three finalists uh, for third place and a prize of $200, uh, Timing Beyond Our Control, Don Jones. Okay, Don, congratulations. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> and for all my um, fellow veterans that I can see or not see, Thank you for your service and to the South Dakota Hum uh, Humanities Council. When I saw it advertised in the paper, it just struck me, oh, I could, I could do that. And I wasn't uh, thinking about uh, reading it to anybody. I wasn't thinking about a Zoom meeting. I wasn't thinking about a certificate or, um, or any money attached. I'm kind of dumbfounded by all of that. But um, thank you. This, it's been a, a really good experience for me. Good. Great. So second place. Uh, and for a prize of $300, uh, that will be short by Dr. Tony Garcia. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the, the honor and, and all of the, yeah, the uh, Jill and Don too for your story. Uh, very inspiring. Thank you. And finally, uh, in first place uh, with her poetry cycle, The Trigger, uh, Jill Baker and for a prize of five hundred dollars congratulations thank you, so much. thank you i wasn't you know just like tony and Jer and uh, don were saying i i wasn't planning on sharing or writing it just uh just felt like it was time you know to start sharing so i really appreciate having you been able to do this and um and everything that you do jerry to help us you know other veterans um, share their pain and their triumphs, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, you know, there, even, even if I haven't met uh, all of you guys in person, you know, veterans are still my family. So thank you for sharing and for trusting us with your stories. Um, I, I feel richer uh, for having read your work. I hope to read more of your work in the future, and I would love to see you submit work to ODARC 30. So I'll, I'll send Jennifer some instructions on that and hope we'll see more writing from everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Thank that's, you. All I, that's all I have for formal presentation. I guess we can open it up to Q&A now if anybody has any, any questions. I know some of you I see from a workshop yesterday and some I don't think I've met yet, but if anybody has questions or if there's uh, anything I can offer that would help support you with your writing, uh, please let me know. I have one. Okay. I wasn't able to attend the workshop yesterday mm -hmm. uh, due to my work and everything, but is that online or anything? Because I, I would like uh, to. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Them. Jennifer, were, was it recorded yesterday? Do you know? Um, I'm not sure if it was recorded. I am going to um, send the slides uh, with the exercises. It's it's a bunch of writing prompts, Tony, and I think uh, you'll you'll find them fairly self-explanatory. But I'll also have my email on there in case anybody has any questions. And uh, what we did yesterday was kind of a series of writing prompts to help people begin to shape their stories and uh, begin to try out some of the tools for the toolbox, or maybe to get a little bit unstuck if they come to a sticking place in their work. And, uh, you know, you'll have my email. Please don't be a stranger. If anybody ever wants to just reach out and talk writing, I do try to get back to people. It can take a couple of weeks sometimes, but uh, I do try to get back to folks. I will just, this is Carolyn with the Humanities Council, and I just want to step in and say, Jennifer does think that the workshop was recorded. It wasn't streamed anywhere, but it was possibly recorded. And so if Jerry is okay with that, we can send it to, to um, Dr. Garcia. Yes.
Okay, then. Um, that pretty much wraps it up here for us. So let me give you a few items of housekeeping again. A uh, sincere thank you to Jerry for your time and your involvement with our Veterans Story Contest. Congratulations to the winners. Your stories were powerful, revealing your vulnerabilities. Thank you for your transparency and thank you for your service. And thank you to all of you for attending the session. Just want to remind you to visit the Zanbro's bookstore link, which I have, I will again place in the chat and please fill out the evaluation form. Your feedback helps us improve your festival experience for festivals to come. And that ends our session. Enjoy your festival weekend.